This is the World Report, your compass to African news and the world beyond. Rwanda is marking 30 years since the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. We'll be bringing you that in just a bit, but first in the headlines. Tanzanian soldiers killed in DR Congo missile attack. The death toll from ferry accident in Mozambique reaches nearly 100. Zimbabwe launches a new gold-backed currency, ZG. Gaza truce talks still deadlocked. Netanyahu sets date for offensive. And Russia says that Ukraine tried to strike nuclear power plant again with drone. I'm Fatihah Mohamed Noor. Welcome to the program. Now, a motor attack in the East Democratic Republic of Congo has killed three soldiers from a southern military force. Southern African Regional Force was invited in by the Congolese government last year to hold to worsening insecurity linked to numerous rebel groups vying for control of territory and eastern DR Congo's rich mineral resources. The death toll from a makeshift ferry boat that capsized in the northern coast of Mozambique has now climbed to 100. Mozambique's Maritime Transport Institute on Monday gave the latest count saying the overloaded fishing boat was not licensed to transport people. An official from Mozambique's Maritime Institute said that initial death toll of 91 rose to 96 after they recovered three more bodies late on Sunday and another two on Monday. The deaths include children and have at least 26 persons still missing, according to local media. There were 130 people on the ferry and 11 had been hospitalized, according to the administrator of the island of Mozambique. Zimbabwe has introduced a gold-backed currency named ZG that stands for Zimbabwe Gold. It is the latest attempt to stabilize an economy that has lurched from crisis to crisis for the past 25 years. Unveiling the new notes, Central Bank Governor said the ZG would be structured and set at a market-determined exchange rate. The ZG replaces the Zimbabwean dollar the RTGS that had lost three quarters of its value so far this year. Hamas has rejected an Israeli ceasefire proposal made in talks in Cairo. According to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, a date was set for an invasion of Rafah, Gaza's last refuge for displaced persons. Israel and Hamas sent teams to Egypt on Sunday for talks that included Qatari and Egyptian mediators as well as CIA Director William Burns. Burns' presence underlined rising pressure from Israel's main ally, the U.S., for a deal that would free Israeli hostages held in Gaza and get aid to Palestinian civilians left destitute by six months of conflict. Russia says that Ukraine has tried to strike the nuclear power plant again with a drone. Russia said on Monday that Ukraine had endangered European nuclear security by attacking the Russian controlled Zaporizhia nuclear power station with a drone which was shot down over a reactor. Ukraine has denied it is behind a series of drone attacks on the plant over the past 48 hours, including three drone attacks on Sunday, which the International Atomic Energy Agency said had endangered nuclear safety. On the big story this week, we focus on the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Patrick Sidikubwabo was only four years old when his father and three siblings were killed during the 1994 Rwandan genocide. 30 years on, he says the memory still haunts him, and is part of his story he can never forget. Another survivor, Jean-Claude Mugabe, was nine when his father and uncles had to flee their house, leaving women and children behind. He says his relatives sought refuge in the village church, but were found and many of them killed. I lost many siblings, you know, close relatives, such as aunt, uncles, cousins, you know. If I count it very well, they lead to 65 people. My uncle, my, the brother of my mom, he died with, with her wife and, her, and his whole children. So the family finished. So this is me. Mugabe later found his little sister and father had been murdered. Uh -huh. I participated, you know, in burying his remain. Uh, the only thing I could remember is his jackets, you know. Others will remain. During a hundred-day period in 1994, 
Rwanda's Hutu majority killed more than 800,000 minority Tutsis and Hutu moderates. The genocide in Rwanda was sparked by hate speech, mostly over the radio, by Hutu extremists against Tutsis. Mugabe says many survivors were traumatized, grieved and radicalized, and at his age, he did not understand why his father had to be killed. And sometimes I can say, if I can see the killer of my father, so I will do that. I will revenge as well. The Aegis Trust, a non-profit dedicated to genocide prevention, has been running genocide memorial centers across the country with the goal of helping people heal and learn about genocide prevention. We do it through peace education program by understanding the past but also building up the skills and the values that helps people to be able to um, develop uh, critical thinking, the empathy, personal responsibility. Mugabe has been part of the program and says it's helped him heal. He has even met with some of his father's killers and forgiven them. I understood better, better and more better when I walked the memorial and I started also supporting others for my community and my colleagues who have not yet moved forward. UNESCO cites a lack of education as one of the causes of genocide saying people tend against each other through misinformation. They have moved to recognize four memorial sites in Rwanda as World Heritage Sites. The sites have to be preserved because what happened here matters for all humanity. It's a stain on the universal conscience and we have to preserve the sites so first as to fight uh, against distortion or denial of history. Rwanda is marking the anniversary of the genocide against Tutsis with 100 days of remembrance. During this period, survivors are calling for more education and awareness to help combat genocide denial and misinformation, part of their healing journey. As a nation, we feel an obligation to uh, continue uh, reminding the world that had we kept to our promises and had we uh, uh, learned from the mistakes of the past, this is a genocide that the world could have prevented. But it didn't happen. Uh, it happened uh, in the full glare of everyone and it claimed more than one million lives. So the world must live with that bitter reality, we must keep reminding one another that uh, it was a failure of the international community, it was a failure of our collective resolve that we had this genocide many decades after we had made a vow of never again. Uh, there are many lessons that can be learned. The question is whether the world is actually learning, because if the world was learning, as it should be, then possibly we couldn't be seeing the situation we see around again. We couldn't see, be seeing the proliferation or recurrence of hate speech around us. Uh, the mistakes of the past have not helped us enough to learn. But again, it's our duty as Rwanda to continue reminding the world that this is the situation we went through. We know it better than everybody else, and we feel an obligation to do that, uh, to, to remind everybody to do the right thing at the right time and we do so without uh, hesitation or without uh, looking back to see who is joining us or who is not because this is something we are ready to do even when we are alone. As the world continues to grapple with climate crisis, how are women affected and what is done to ensure that they are empowered economically? We are working um, with government of Kenya and under the leadership of the president for example, to address the issue of women's uh, political representation in parliament through the uh, actualization of the two-thirds gender principle. We are also working with partners such as the ones that are gathered here to shift that female face of poverty through climate smart agriculture that's targeting women and their households. We are making strides in terms of how we respond to climate change with women at the center, empowering women with information, with um, uh, skills, with resources, with small capital, so that they can turn around um, the farming business from just being subsistent um, uh, farming that is producing very little to um, big uh, agriculture business 
that's fitting not only their families but in uh, turning our food security into a reality in the face of climate change there is really opportunities in agriculture for young people you know if you look at the whole value chain from production up to consumption you know agro processing transportation so what we really should do is really to invest and actually so happy because we are really talking to the media the impact of disinformation and misinformation has been seen globally but what can be done to ensure that this actually stops there are a lot of conversations around uh, misinformation and uh, disinformation and the impact in uh, the third world but it may be useful first of all to define the difference in uh, misinformation and uh, disinformation now, disinformation is the deliberate uh, act of uh, spreading uh, information with uh, a malicious uh, intent or with an intention to occasion uh, specific uh, reactions, while uh, misinformation is when somebody sends out uh, information, it's not deliberate in any manner, but it ends up uh, making people react in a, a particular way. Now, there's been uh, global conversations on uh, the threat of uh, misinformation information, uh, in Africa, and uh, research has uh, confirmed that, uh, in fact, uh, misinformation and uh, disinformation is a threat to national security because the architects of uh, misinformation and the disinformation, their principal concern is uh, to influence the thinking of a majority of uh, people in a specific country by engaging, number one, in uh, opinion uh, shaping, and number two, influencing uh, electoral outcomes. And uh, we've had some this is uh, both uh, Kenya and at a global level. For instance, at a global level, the United States of America accuses uh, Russia of engaging in acts of uh, disinformation and misinformation around their electoral process. And uh, also another example which comes to mind is uh, Brexit, because again, uh, Russia was accused of uh, creating an environment where people in fact uh, voted to get out of uh, Brexit while in fact they did not know what they were voting for. And because of uh, this uh, huge threat of uh, misinformation and uh, disinformation, uh, nations are coming up with, uh, with uh, systems and uh, early warning infrastructure to ensure don't become victims of uh, misinformation and uh, disinformation. Number one, what would happen uh, when the architects of uh, misinformation and disinformation come up with their strategies, the first thing they want to do is to influence uh, public opinion. So they want to be sure that they influence the public thinking in a particular manner. And that this one can be reflected uh, in the electoral outcomes. Because when you've got a, a population which has been conditioned to vote in a particular manner, then it can affect uh, the electoral outcome. And for the case of uh, Kenya, after elections, you will find uh, some election losers are uh, accusing uh, the electoral board IBC of uh, mismanaging the elections. Now, if you continue repeating uh, that statement, that in fact, IBC has no capacity to run a free and fair election, then people will start uh, believing in that. And that alone is a threat to democracy because uh, voters will lose uh, confidence in the capacity of IBC to run a free and fair election. And the other elections that they may not uh, participate. People use uh, disinformation and misinformation to condition uh, the country into a specific mood. Like for instance, when, uh, when there's an issue of a discussion, a topical issue in any country, you may find aspects of disinformation and misinformation coming up to spread, to spread information so that they can achieve a, a specific uh, objective. Then uh, the question arises, how do you stop misinformation and uh, disinformation in the context of uh, artificial intelligence? In my view, there's need for both the public and private sectors to work uh, together so that they can set up mechanisms to fight uh, disinformation and uh, misinformation. Because if they do not do that, then the architects of uh, misinformation and disinformation will have a blank check, they will influence uh, public opinion, they will influence uh, the electoral process, and they'll do that in a manner which is not aligned to a nation's specific or public uh, interest. So it's important for the public and uh, private sectors to work uh, together and come up with the early warning infrastructure. In fact, countries uh, like the United States and uh, France have come up with uh, specialized units whose uh, practical and uh, simple responsibility is to detect 
misinformation and disinformation and uh, neutralize uh, the same. Now, for a normal citizen, how do you detect that uh, there is misinformation? It means that uh, one has to be media literate, that uh, when uh, you get uh, content, especially on uh, social media, you should apply crit critical thinking to ask yourself whether or not, in fact, that content, uh, content uh, makes uh, sense. And one of the things to do is that uh, you must rely on the legacy media because uh, they've got internal control systems and they've got a reputation uh, to protect. So it means that when you consume information and when you consume content from uh, legacy media, the probability of getting it wrong is uh, almost uh, zero. On parting clips this week, the North America witnessed the total solar eclipse. Total solar eclipse that swept across Mexico, the United States and Canada has completed its journey over continental North America. Last to see the dramatic celestial spectacle were sky gazers located along the Atlantic coast of Newfoundland, Canada. In the U.S., an estimated 32 million people live within the path of totality. And a total solar eclipse was visible for those in Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, Illinois, Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, although weather threatened to spoil the fun for some. On that note, we wrap up World Report this week. Remember, if you have any comment or feedback, you can reach me on my social media at Noor Fatheer. Thank you for watching.